are discovering more every day. And there is a big economic incentive to uh, ensuring that those newly discovered fossil fuels get sold and the fuels get burned. Recently, shale gas has been discovered in various parts of North America. Uh, and we are looking to establish new pipelines to the West Coast and to the New Orleans area in order to remove uh, tar sands oil uh, to refineries and ship them out to various parts of the world. These new reserves aren't included in this, yet they're a threat as well. And finally, this only talks about carbon dioxide. It doesn't take into account other heat trapping gases, like methane, which, as you know, form an important part of the heat trapping gas that is accumulated in the atmosphere. So, therefore, this is a conservative estimate which says that within approximately 11 years, we will have reached the point at the current rate of burning of fossil fuels where we can no longer reduce to 20% the chance of us getting to only a 2 degree Celsius increase in uh, average surface temperature. So, what does all of this show? It shows that we are in deep trouble. We are threatened by catastrophe. Uh, every day, and more so in the coming decades. However, not everybody perceives this as a threat, which is interesting in itself. Problems can exist, but people don't regard them necessarily as social problems, as problems that affect large numbers of people and that need to be acted upon. And the second interesting thing about this threat is not only that not everybody perceives it as a threat, the second thing that's interesting about it is that the threat is not evenly distributed in society. Some people are at far greater risk from this problem than others are. Let me deal with the first question first, which is how is it that a problem does or does not get defined as a social problem? as a problem requiring collective action. Before uh, a problem such as the one I've described, namely global warming, can enter the public consciousness and be defined as a social problem that one ought to act upon, several things have to happen. Uh, I've outlined them on my next slide. The first thing that has to happen for a, an environmental issue to be turned into a social problem requiring action is that scientists, policy-oriented scientists, and the environmental movement, the mass media, and respected organizations have to discover and promote the issue. Unless scientists, the environmental movement, the mass media, and respected organizations discover the problem and promote it as being a problem, it won't be recognized as such. So, global warming theory was first proposed uh, more than a century ago. But leading scientists only started publishing research on the subject in the 1970s. And it became a public issue, something that people noticed, really only in the 1980s. Because it was in the 1980s that a big drought occurred in North America, making newspaper headlines and magazine cover stories. And it was only in the 1980s when the environmental movement started publicizing the threat of global warming. And it was only in the 1980s that insurance companies and the United Nations took up the cause of global warming. Insurance companies, because they realized that they stood to lose an enormous amount of money in insurance payouts, paying for the consequences of global warming. And the United Nations, because many of the nations who constitute that body recognized that they were threatened by what was happening. So it was only then that the mass media started taking it up, the 1980s. So that's one thing that had to happen in order to turn this issue into a problem that was recognized as such. The second thing that had to happen was that ordinary people had somehow to connect real-life events to the information that was being 
learn from these various groups that I just mentioned. Um, in other words, people had to see that this was not just something theoretical or something that could happen in principle, but something that affected them in their everyday lives. And that too uh, happened in the 1980s, when an awful drought hit North America, people had to ration water, crops failed on a mass scale, suddenly people felt the weather had changed in some substantial way, and what was being said by the mass media, by policy-oriented scientists, by the environmental movement and so on, suddenly started to make sense to large numbers of people. If you track public opinion polls throughout the 1980s, you see a quite rapid rise in the proportion of North Americans who say that global warming is a problem and we must do something about it. The third thing that has to happen before an issue like global warming enters the public consciousness gets defined as a social, as a social problem requiring collective action. The third thing that has to happen is that scientists and industrial interests and politicians who dispute the existence of environmental threats must fail to convince the public that the threat is illusory, is an illusion, and that human intervention is unnecessary. You see, in the real world, there are certain people who are opposed to the notion that global warming is taking place. And they are opposed for very plain reasons that have to do with their own material interests. You can find, for example, that the countries which produce oil and the industries which produce fossil fuels are very much opposed to the idea of global warming. They hire scientists, some scientists, a small minority of scientists, to do research which seems to show that global warming is not caused by humans, not a very big threat, something that we can safely ignore. So you find that coal producers in the United States, oil producers in Saudi Arabia, and others promote this kind of research showing that global warming is really not a big problem. It's a small minority of scientists who do it. There's sort of guns for hire. One of the main guns for hire is an American scientist who was also hired by the tobacco industry back in the 60s to show that smoking doesn't cancer, now we're showing that global warming doesn't exist, saying you don't understand the kind of scientists we're talking about here. So there are interests in the world who are opposed to uh, uh, the, the majority viewpoints who want to obfuscate or muddy the issue. It's necessary for there to be some kind of, or what takes place in the mass media, is a debate. Campaigns, competing campaigns in which some people argue that global warming exists and it's a real problem and other people say, well, it's not really much of a problem, it can be ignored. Only if the latter, the people who say it's not a real problem, are vastly outnumbered by people and organizations in great authority will the issue of global warming be recognized as a social problem. And this is precisely what has happened the overwhelming majority of climate scientists, the overwhelming majority, indeed almost all uh, scientific organizations whose uh, members study the problem, have argued that global warming is real, that human activity is the major cause of global warming, and they sort of drowned out the voices of opposition to a very large degree. So these three things had to happen. In other words, what I want to say is that a social problem is something that is socially constructed. It just doesn't happen. Problems don't automatically get defined as socially significant. These three things have to happen before they do. And in the case of global warming, they have happened since the 1980s, which is why they are recognized as being uh, a major issue now. Now, in addition, to be socially defined, as I have outlined now, environmental problems are socially distributed, by which I mean that environmental risks are greater for some groups than they are for others. 
And it is this issue which I would like to examine briefly now. I guess, like me, all of you are at least occasional television watchers, and you may have uh, on occasion turned on the news to find out that a tornado has touched down on some unlucky community. When it does, TV reporters rush to uh, the surviving members of the community, and very often you find that they're in trailer parks. That's where they go when there's a tornado. They go to a trailer park and they talk to the survivors. And the survivors stand amidst the rubble of the trailer park. They remark on the generosity of their neighbors, their good fortune in still having their family intact, and our inability to fight nature's destructive course, uh, uh, forces. The question is, why trailer parks? Why do reporters rush to trailer parks when tornadoes occur? Well, small twisters aren't particularly uh, attractive to trailer parks as opposed to other kinds of residential communities. Uh, reporters are attracted to trailer parks when a twister touches down, when a tornado touches down, because trailer parks suffer a lot of damage from tornadoes. They suffer much more damage than solidly built houses with good foundations and strong roofs. Uh, in other words, if you go to a rich neighborhood where a twister touches down, you're not going to find anywhere near as much damage as you'll find in a trailer park, where entire homes get swept up into a cyclone. That's a general pattern. Where there are disadvantaged people, and of course disadvantaged people live in trailer parks, people with less money, than those who live in rich neighborhoods. When disaster strikes economically and politically disadvantaged people and middle class and well-to-do people, it is almost always the most disadvantaged people who suffer the most. They are the ones who are most at risk. They are the ones who are most vulnerable. In fact, well-to-do people often put disadvantaged people uh, in harm's way, in order to avoid risk themselves. So, for example, oil refineries, chemical plants, toxic dumps, garbage incinerators, and other environmentally dangerous installations are more likely to be built in poor communities with a high percentage of members of ethnic and racial minority groups than in more affluent, mainly white communities. That's because disadvantaged people are often too politically weak to oppose the construction of such dangerous facilities in their neighbor neighborhoods. And some of them may even value the jobs that such facilities create. So in one American study, uh, the number and, and, and size of hazardous waste facilities were recorded for every zip code area in the United States. An American zip code is like a Canadian postal code. So these sociologists figured out how many hazardous waste sites uh, were constructed in each zip code in the United States. And they also found out the racial composition of people living in each zip code. And what they discovered was that at a time when uh, about 20% of Americans were of African or Hispanic origin, zip code areas that lacked any such uh, hazardous waste facilities had on average a 12% minority population. So 20% of the population is black or Hispanic, but in areas lacking any of these dangerous facilities, 12% uh, of the people were in a, a minority population. Zip code areas that had one such dangerous facility had a 24% minority population, and zip code areas with more than one such dangerous facility had on average a 38% minority population. In other words, what they found systematically was that the most dangerous facilities were built in areas with a proportion of blacks and Hispanics that was higher than the national average. They found 
that three out of five African and Hispanic Americans live in communities with uncontrolled toxic waste sites. Or, let me just skip a couple, a Canadian example. A Canadian example. Here what I did was I took each um, province and territory of Canada and I found out two things about each province and territory. One was how many aboriginals live in that province or territory as a percentage of the population. And secondly, how much particulate matter, how many tons of pollution is in the air of those provinces or territories. And the relationship between these two variables is pretty clear cut. Wherever aboriginals form a larger proportion of the population, there you find more pollution in the air. There's a strong relationship between these two factors. Aboriginal Canadians are disproportionately exposed to pollution from uh, petroleum and gas production, mines, pulp and paper mills, coal-burning electric generators. But you know, there's really nothing new about this. It represents the continuation, the last chapter in a long Canadian tradition. You'll remember I talked earlier about the first atomic bombs at the Alamogordo bombing range in New Mexico, or Hiroshima. You know, they were both made, these two, first two atom bombs, they were both made from uranium that came from the Northwest Territories in Canada, from a place called Port Radium. But let me tell you what went on in Port Radium around the time these first atom bombs were built. What the government of Canada did was that it hired 30 Aboriginal Canadians, hunters and trappers, from the Dene Nation, D-E-N-E, and they were paid $3 a day to haul and ferry uranium across the Northwest Territories from Port Radium to Fort McMurray in Alberta. They worked 12 hours a day, six days a week, hauling the uranium in 45-pound burlap bags. You know what burlap is? It's the material that you use to make sacks. Um, this is a problem because uranium is radioactive. You need to have lead, thick lead, separating you from the uranium in order to avoid getting radiation poisoning. And here, these members of the Dene Nation were working 12 hours a day, six days a week, hauling uranium on their backs, or in sleds or whatever, uh, and these were wrapped in burlap bags, offering no protection at all. They were never told about the dangers of radon gas uh, emerging from the uranium and poisoning them. And it's interesting that they were not told about this because uh, some years earlier, the Canadian Department of Mines published studies on port radium warning about the poisonous and life-threatening uh, effects of uranium. In other words, we had scientific studies by 1937, showing that uranium caused radiation poisoning. We knew it was dangerous, and even knowing that, we got these Aboriginal people to haul uranium without any protection whatsoever. Not only that, but uh, they were allowed to eat fish that was contaminated from ponds where the uh, from dredging ponds that were contaminated with uranium. The children of these people were allowed to play with uh, the dusty uranium ore at river docks and portage landings. And the wives of these men were allowed to sew tents from the radioactive sacks that were used to carry the uranium. So in other words, we poisoned a community knowing today and for some decades, there's been a cancer epidemic in Port Radium. 600 residents of this small community are dying of colon and other cancers, and it's directly attributable to radiation poisoning. So this tradition of situating the most harmful environmental sites in 
uh, areas where the most vulnerable Canadians live actually has, is a tradition that goes back to the 1940s. This is what many sociologists call environmental racism. The tendency to heap environmental dangers on the disadvantaged. And if you want to, I've got here a slide uh, of Toronto. And you can look at this at home. One slide shows the air pollution in different Toronto neighborhoods, and the second one shows the uh, prevalence of poverty in Toronto neighborhoods. And as you look through this, you will see that poverty and pollution correlate highly. The most polluted areas of Toronto are the areas with the greatest concentration of poor people. Now what's true for disadvantaged people in the United States and Canada, namely that the most disadvantaged are most exposed to environmental risk, is also true when we compare rich countries and developing countries. That is to say, the people in developing countries are more exposed to environmental risk than people in rich countries. In North America, Western Europe, in Japan, population growth is slow or negative, and industry and government are in fact eliminating some of the worst excesses of industrialization. But in the less developed countries, in the southern hemisphere, population growth is rapid, and some countries, such as Brazil, China, and India, are industrializing rapidly. This is putting tremendous strain on their natural resources, rising demand for water, electricity, fossil fuels, and consumer products is creating more polluted rivers, dead lakes, and industrial waste, uh, waste sites. Rainforests, grazing land, cropland, and wetlands are giving way in China, Brazil, India, and elsewhere to factories, roads, airports, housing complexes, and smog blanketed megacities are sprawling. I'll give you a couple of illustrations. Let's hope they work. First, the Chinese story. Find a home for me, but not yet. They're everywhere. Just a minute, let's see if there's a little bit. Well, I guess you'll have to do this at home. This is a video from the New York Times which talks about trucks in China and how they're burning low grade fuel and adding tremendously to the level of pollution in the country. What this results in is the following kind of scene. This picture was taken just last January in central Beijing in Tiananmen Square. You'll see the way many people walk around. 16, this is a little caption below, 16 of the world's 20th most polluted cities are in China. Air quality in Beijing deteriorated beyond World Health Organization safe limits every day in January 2013. Official measurements of fine airborne particulates, those that are 2.5 microns, thousands of an inch, of a centimeter or less, pose the largest health risks. Those, the concentration of those particulates rose to 993 micrograms per cubic meter on the 12th of January, compared with World Health Organization guidelines of no more than 25 micrograms per cubic meter. In other words, pollution is so bad in Beijing, it is multiples of what is considered safe. And this is normal every day in January 2013. It was this bad. Or let's go to India for a moment, where you can buy this nifty car, the Nano by Tata Motors in Mumbai, for the sum of only $2,804.25 plus tax. 
This is within the budget of a middle class Indian, which is why people who formerly rode bicycles or small motorcycles are in the tens and hundreds of millions now turning to these small cars. The trouble is that in a less developed country like India, there are no catalytic converters on the cars. They're not required that will reduce air pollution. The gasoline tends to be of relatively low quality, and this produces an enormous amount of pollution. It's why pollution in China, especially, but also in India and many well less developed countries, is causing cities in particular to become great choking messes. Uh, weaker regulations ensure that. For the time being, however, it is richer countries that are causing most environmental damage. And that's because the inhabitants of wealthy countries, people like you and me, earn more and consume more than the inhabitants of less developed countries. I will explore some of the consequences of this after you take a five-minute break, but no more than that. Thank you.